I just got a nice uh, couple of donations, one of which wants to remain anonymous. Another one is an older, um, that is to say, is a uh, long, a several times donor. Donor. So, I want to thank you, Mr. Uh, Miss Ms. Anonymous, and um, and you too, Carol. Uh, very much appreciate it. All right. Uh, seems like a very good day to talk about um, to to do this this uh, subject, dismal out, rainy, too dark to paint, can't even see your brushes, warm coffee, all the stuff you need, right? I, I forget this coffee and I let it sit there. <laughs> just pretty funny. It just sits there and gets cold and I guess I better use it up right now while I can, while I'm chatting with you. Uh, I don't, I, it feels like I've done this. It feels like I've done it three times, uh, Christian. Because I've, I think I've said about doing it three or four times and realized both, or whatever number of times that I was into something way, way, way bigger than I had time for or would ever probably have time for. But, but I still have a, uh, an, an, an earnestness about the subject and I appreciate your bringing it up, at least an aspect of the subject. Um, here's here's uh, Christian's set of points. Uh, and I, there's some chance I may have talked about part of one of these or two, but I'm going to do a little more in depth in any case, and uh, and focus mostly on <clears throat> on the point about the aphorisms and uh, the um, shop talk discussion. But um, Christian says uh, you've mentioned Paul Valéry, the French intellectual. Can you talk about this man and his impact on Gamel's thought? Uh, I, I should just stop right there for a second and say the answer to that is. <laughs> I don't, I don't have inside information about Gamel's thoughts about Valerie. What I've seen is the shop talk of Edgar Degas, just like you. Uh, I have to say, I took a few minutes to look at, um, uh, over time, you know, in his, in the, at his house, at his uh, apartment, at his um, studio, studio, and uh, was looking there for um, various, you know, getting a sense of what he read. and. You know, it gave me a great deal of pause about how poorly read I am in relation to what Gamel was, and and I've read my share of uh, of, of of the right, so we say, the right kind of literature. But I doubt that there's anything even beginning to be comparable to a beginning like the uh, like the Groton School would have provided for uh, for Gamel in his start. So I, uh, just, it caused me to return to my uh, humble base. And uh, without any apologies, by the way, I've enjoyed very much the search, uh, digging through um, the uh, philosophy and poetry and all the rest in my own way. But it's been a personalized hunt, you know, in which I just follow trails, as opposed to a directed or well-directed, you might even say, one coming out of one of the great uh, uh, schools, um, prep schools. But, and yeah, and again, I, I, I doubt that I'd ever apologize for that. I don't know that I wanted to be directed, although I would love to have been directed, as long as I didn't lose track of the um, of the pleasure I had in the self search, you know, in the search for my, of, of my own, um, and um, you know, instead of having the right thoughts, having having awareness, and always coming from you know uh, from within, I guess is the best way to say it. So, but no, I don't actually know anything about that. I know that Gamble read <coughs> Carl Jung. He was a big fan of Henry James uh, <coughs> and a few other novelists. He's, I, I know he's read, he read um, Fitzgerald and any number of people of his own time. Um, but uh, so, and I also know that he read poetry and read thoughts about poetry, read, uh, which I really do enjoy myself, that uh, whole discussion uh, by poets about their work and about the, about the art itself. But, um, yeah. So, and but but he read a, he read widely on on, on religion on uh, you know for his pictures I assume and uh, and, uh, and 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 psychology uh, as much as any body of stuff you know uh, that I saw. So, um, but the second point was: Are there any intellectuals that have influenced your thinking? And uh, that's my thinking. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, let me just show you some of the places I and the influence of your of your thinking. I mean, you're always looking for answers, right? When you first start out, and among other things, I was assuming, like many of you have, that the um, that there is something about the subject that is the all important thing, 
And it took me some while to disabuse myself of that idea. But, um, but nevertheless, in that search, you know, here's uh, Longinus on the sublime. These are, these are Greek. Uh, you have Aristotle, the poetics. Uh, these, are read, these are things I read way back then. I read Burke um, on the sublime and the beautiful. I read Burke and a number of others. You know, who hasn't read you know, Goethe and, um, and uh, Kant? But, um, and I read fairly widely on aesthetics itself eventually. But um, the, um, uh, but you then come up with another question, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about it now, and that is having to do with the influence of C.S. Lewis. As I was working along, and I realized at one point when Gamma was speaking to me that I was not uh, analyzing. Uh, he used the expression, as I think I've said to you before, <clears throat> um, you need to think things through, or have you thought this through? If you think that through, you'll get to... And the question of thinking through was a sort of a vague, what the heck is that thinking through? You sort of have an idea that it must be in thinking a thing over to you, to, you, to, to understand it in some way. But, um, but, it, but it also sounded like it must be in the realm of a good discipline and that sort of thing. And at that point, I read all kinds of stuff because I realized that, and I was very hot for it. I mean, at the age of 26, they say, a young man's, uh, if you know, fancy, <laughs> turns to logic and, uh, and thinking process. You actually begin to be a thinker. I've read. I don't, I'm not that scientist, so I wouldn't be able to affirm that. But, but it was interesting that that's what happened to me literally right, right at the age of 26. Um, but I was reading, uh, because I'd already read C.S. Lewis as a younger man, and I think this particular book, The Abolition of Man, uh, was extremely thought-provoking. And uh, I don't mean just in the sense of of um, what the content was, but the idea of good thinking, you know, and uh, it was very evident that he was thinking through, uh, and he was trying to get these people to think clearly, you know, the people he's talking about in this, in this very interesting uh, book on education. So he was one of the guys that I had in my background, as well as re having read, by the way, a number of his essays. Um, so at that time, I was reading some of those essays as well, and I ran into a discussion about uh, his education. Uh, if not just simply how to, something to do with how to think. And he mentioned two guys. One is, um, one is Edwin Bevan and the other is Owen Barfield. And, um, and uh, both of them were in that class. They really helped you to think through by, by, by naming things, by, by, um, by giving clear identity to what you're talking about, to the pieces of what you're talking about and so on. And uh, so those two books, Symbolism and Belief and Poetic Diction, I particularly like Poetic Diction, but the other one might have been easier to to you know to see how a how a cold-blooded thinker works and the reason i spend my time on this though is i found the need for it because we're living in a time when you really have to think this through for yourself in fact you always should have but but because the uh, the the body of teachers around you apart from gamel himself isn't very good i mean there aren't guys who who uh, have this long background where they just load on the history much like i mentioned Groton. you know you have these guys who just have the background in education that is to say in the great books for example and uh, they can just sort of coach you along coach you up uh that isn't here in painting anymore and uh Gamble, i think really was the last bit of a person with it um, unless there's somebody out there i and there probably is <laughs> I have no idea about it. One can always hope. So, uh, so the necessity to learn to think and analyze information you get uh, is really a big deal, right? So, hey, by the way, I wanted to say something else about what I'm doing here. I'm going to be doing these aphorisms, um, talking about them. And what I want to do is hold this in abeyance. Not, I mean, I won't do the whole thing. There's so many. But I thought I would just introduce you to the idea of the, uh, of the sayings. Um, uh, and so... When you said, did you teach yourself to study or have any techniques for reading the sayings of artists? And uh, Christian then says, I asked because you've mentioned aphorisms and C.S. Lewis is someone who interested you. Well, aphorisms is this thing, you know, <laughs> I was a kid, I think I've mentioned you all before in, uh, in Algebra 2 in high school when I was sitting there in my first day maybe of this class. And here's this guy who obviously had a love for his field. Uh, but he also had a wall that started about maybe just above the blackboards, whatever height that is, seven feet high maybe, uh, maybe less. And from there and the next three or four feet were these, you know, card-sized aphorisms. You could read from your chair, you, these, these sayings that you could just read from your seat. 
And I couldn't get any thinking done about algebra for the longest time because of that content up there. It was just fascinating to me as heck. I'd never seen so many bits of wisdom, shall we say. And, and, and it was the stuff that just made me want to be there. It's a strange thing to say. And, uh, I, as much as I like math, <laughs> mathematics, I, I really, um, this thing was rich and deep. You know, there was something he was doing there that was really impressive. And I, I don't know if he's around today. I doubt that he is. <laughs> he would be, I think he would be 100 years old, but he was, uh, or maybe 110. But 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 I'd love to tell him what a what a, what a thing that was in my in my development. Anyway, so ever since that time, I've been on this uh, roll, right, to find these aphorisms. I I shouldn't say you know, but it was I didn't little did I know it was the shop talk, you know, I was looking for it was the words of painters that actually had depth and had serious understanding, and I and I kept finding them as I would go through books like these here. I would uh, like this is uh, this is. Uh, 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 the treatise on painting uh, by uh, Da Vinci. Next to that, on the right, is the Reynolds. Um, then there's a book by Walter Pock on 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 Ang. Uh, but then down below it, you're seeing the the Julia Cartwright book. Very beautifully selected quotations from. Um, and I've read the Sensier book as well, which is really his letters and all that sort of stuff. And I think she's selected by far. Uh, isolated the best stuff. So she's a, and she's a pleasant read from the point of view of telling a story as well. Julia Cartwright was the author, was an author uh, of that day of 19th century that wrote, I guess into the 20th, that wrote uh, biographies um, uh, of, you know, documents, doc, doc, well, I, I guess they're just biographies, but they have a, they have a little bit of a storytelling element, so whatever you call that sort. Uh, but then there's Fromentin, who was a painter, and the masters of pastime, and then uh, Ro Ro uh, Rothenstein, Men and Memories, two volumes of his work that are just loaded with what, with what painters said at the time, and he knew everybody. He knew everybody from Degas and everybody before and after for quite some distance, uh, and interviewed them in different ways, knew them, but knew them, and ate dinner, ate lunches with them, and that sort of thing. So, um, and in each of these books, I would find. Um, Gold, and I began to think of it as mining gold. You know, I'm, I'm a Western kid, so I remember seeing the tailings up there on the hillside. You know, that'd be a big pile of rocks that are at the bottom of the base of a, of a sort of a cave, the mine, and uh, and uh, you know, all that was the draw. So there's so many words you have to go through to find gold, right? <laughs> to find really useful stuff. But it was again, it was always the shop talk. It was always practical information that related to painting. And frequently, I'd find it and wouldn't know what the heck it meant, but it seemed important, and I just would take notes and. Um, and, uh, and, and, and save them somewhere. Some of it just literally find a shelf in my brain. Uh, right, Jeff? And, uh, but, so here you're seeing Vermeer by Hale. Uh, these are the ones that are right, you know, really these are the ones that, that begin to talk about what happened in this big shift. Uh, the Velasquez book by Stevenson, they're written at a similar time. Kenyon Cox's book, you know, the classic point of view and several others, you know, concerning painting, what's called what is painting. Uh, Old Masters and New and two others. Um, Gamble wrote The Boston Painters. Uh, the, uh, and Sargent, the, the Sargent book on Char by Charteris is actually quite a good read um, with a number of excellent uh, uh, witness, eyewitness uh, descriptions of things that he didn't said. So um, uh, this just gets you started though about where my mining took place. Now, some other time, I, if you like, I will talk in depth about just the books, the the books on my list, or more in depth, maybe give you a book review of a number of them. If I haven't already done that, I'll have to look. My producer assures me I haven't done this yet, so uh, so here I am. Uh, nevertheless, then there's the gamels. Gamels in the middle of this page is the uh, lesson of uh, uh, the lesson of Ang of, via Amari Duval, and um, uh, next to that is the impressions on painting, which I quote frequently. Um, uh, Alfred Stevens. Uh, Alfred Stevens was apparently the one of the key influences on on how to paint, how to handle paint, the paint problem, with Degas. And then here's Gamel's other book, The Shop Talk of Edgar Degas, which really, you know, that really whets your whistle or whets your whets your appetite for um, for uh, aphorisms, if nothing else will. But that's all I did. I was just looking for information. I didn't want to have somebody tell me about so and so. I wanted to hear what they said. And that's everything I've done in, the, in that category was to search for what they said. So what I thought I'd do is today is, I'm, that's an introduction, but I thought I'd spend a few minutes just talking about some of Gamel's aphorisms, some of the things he said. 
And just maybe describe a little bit of what he meant, if it's possible. I don't think I'm going to cover all of this today, but but then uh, over time, when we have a rainy day or some other excuse, I'll uh, I'll resort to this. Or when you, you no, none of you have brought me a question, <laughs> and I know I'm do, I'm overdue to finish some demonstrations. I get that, and I will soon. <laughs> um, but um, I was digging around, and. <laughs> And um, this gives you an idea of the kind of stuff I would do, though. Here's this typewritten paper. I had a typewriter in my studio for some reason. I have no idea why I had it there. But my, my handwriting, I never trusted it. I'd be able to read it again later. I found a couple of things, actually, in handwriting, some some other things that Gamel said. Yeah, here's one that I clearly wrote down when he was, uh, right after he had left, per his instructions. He would hand you, Tom Dunley referred to that. He would hand you this notepad. This was it. <laughs> and he would say, don't say I never gave you anything. And then he would expect you to use this to keep uh, a running um, journal. Just this little dinky thing, a pad. I think he got them for 10 cents each at the, uh, at the uh, what were still in those days, stationery stores. But um, let's see if one of these is interesting. Um, Oh, so I so I'd started a, a, a painting under Gamel's tutelage of a friend of his, and he Gamel's really doing a, very sincerely trying to get me started in uh, in portrait painting, uh, in a professional way. So he said, put up a large brown board covered with brown paper, a large board covered with brown paper. Place it near the stand in a sight size place, and as you become acquainted with uh, your sitter, you should also be making notations on the paper to discover. Uh, what where sight size is on the floor and uh, and 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 um, and something else that I can't read. <laughs> but this is just you know I just took these notes after Gamble had spoken with me. And so he was he had gotten me a sort of a, a person who needed who constantly needed portraits, and he was going to coach me through a good portrait that this guy could then uh, use on one of the hospitals, for example, that he was a major donor to. Gamel had those sorts of friends. <laughs> I guess we all do, uh, uh, but but Gamel lived among that uh, group of people. Um, yeah, I've quoted uh, there's another quote here, but I've given it to you before. Um, but but this one I thought was actually rather a fascinating one. It gets us started, and another time I'll uh, I'll come back to this guy. But I've referred to Baron Grow a number of times, and so I don't even know where I where I was reading at the time, and that was one of those things where I really, you know, if I had been well educated, I would have automatically written down what the book was, maybe even the date or publisher of the book. But uh, I quoted Baron Grohl before, because he's the guy that says, you know, when you're painting, you want to make sure that everything is always in order, so that if you drop dead, the picture will be actually unified and saleable for that reason. But ha enjoy this with me if you can, uh, and, I, and I'm going to, uh, as I go through it, Baron Gross says, I couldn't demonstrate my belief at that time, but it came to me through what I call instinct. Oh, by the way, Baron Gross was a painter of, of the sort of same background as, as Ang. I want to tell you he was a student of David. That part I really uh, have forgotten. Uh, you can look it up, but he's not one of those guys who just say, we worship this guy or anything like that. He's not, he's not in that class, but he's, but he's a very good painter with very profound knowledge. So he said, I, I couldn't demonstrate my belief at that time, but it came to me through what I might call instinct. By the way, there, right there is a really amazing concept, right? That's what we're all working with, right? And you're instinctively following what I'm saying because there's something in you that says yes about this thing, right? That's in instinct, what he thinks of as instinct, for lack of a better name. But instinct is something which transcends knowledge. We undoubtedly have in our brains some finer fibers which enable us to perceive truths which we cannot attain through logical deduction and which it would be futile to attempt to achieve through any willful effort of thinking. Oh, my golly, I am really in trouble here now. I just quoted Nikola Tesla. <laughs> and that's an astounding thing, actually, in itself. In other words, people that I read, and uh, so I've always cross-fertilized, and apologies for calling that Baron Grow. <laughs> it's on this list of Baron Grow quotes. Uh, so, I, so I was reading Tesla at the time. Somebody said to me, this is the coolest thing. Well, look, read this guy's crazy biography. And um, Tesla's the, the, really the father of electricity. But isn't that fascinating? That is totally fascinating why well, I wrote it down. And so it's applied ever since that time. <laughs> and I had a discussion with a student just this past week or so. And you see this all the time where people want to be black and white, cut and dried. And they don't know that what they want, the training they really want is to be an instinctive painter. In other words, to see with their eyes and with their 
feelings, with their instincts, with their intuitions, and not with their mechanics, and not be driven and held held to task by the mechanics of realism. And it's and it and it, it gets you there. It gets you there with far more and, and a lot more potential uh, of doing something with it. So, with apologies to Tesla. All right. So let's get on. I'm checking the other two. So here is here's Baron Grove though. Here's a guy way back then, and we think of this sort of a conversation as an impressionist one, but it's not. It's it's the overall thinking. He says, proceed by the whole, by the ensemble, the ensemble of the long lines of the light and shadow, the ensemble of the overall impression. You must never occupy yourself with one part without looking at the whole. Are you doing the head? Look at the feet and thus the rest. And then just continuing, he says, conduct the whole simultaneously. Work in a way that if the work should be interrupted, there would always be a homogeneity in every part, no matter how advanced the drawing. So do you follow how crucial that little piece of information is? But that was the kind of stuff I was mining at the time, right? And it's not on this, this quote list, so you might have to listen to it again. <laughs> Copy it or I'll go find a nice biography of Baron Grove. If that's where it even shows up, it's got to show up in one of those places. So, all right, well, that's, 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 that's the game. So I would go out there and I was showing you these. I would pull up these cards. Uh, probably I also observed this from Gamel that he would, uh, he would keep cards. So I was typing, right? Here's, a, here's, here's Ang talking about Phidias. Here's Millet uh, talking about decline in painting. Here's a good one, isn't it? Art began to decline from the moment the artist no longer leaned directly and simply upon impressions taken directly from nature. Do you see how impressionism <laughs> and impressions are, the whole idea precedes impressionism, right? Everybody is talking about impressions. Baron Gros just mentioned impressions. Millet is talking about impressions. These, were all, these guys all preceded uh, uh, Monet. Uh, art began to decline from the moment the artist no longer leaned directly and simply upon impressions taken from, directly from nature. Then clever execution rapidly took the place of nature and decadence began. Force departs directly you turn aside from nature as we learn from the fable of Antaeus. I've never forgotten that fa fable, by the way, whose power failed when his feet no longer rested on the ground and who recovered his strength every time he touched the earth. So that's Millet. And uh, that's, I'm sure that quote is in the, uh, is in the Cartwright book, but, um, but that's what I did. I didn't want to have to read those books over and over again. So I took those pieces out. Uh, and sometimes I've, I have read again and found that I didn't miss anything crucial. Uh, and, and have and have used most of it of the material. So um, yeah, there's so much beautiful stuff. So so this is so Gamble's doing it for us in this in this uh, shop talk of Edgar Degas. Then, but these are let me just hand you a, maybe a page of Gamblisms. Okay, what I'm calling Gamblisms. <laughs> these are things we heard at. At, at Gamel's, you know, at Gamel's, uh, I shall we say, table at his, uh, at his uh, side. Now, uh, the arabesque, this is me talking now, the arabesque, the figure created by the leading lines of a composition, Gamel says about it, the arabesque is a question of values, not colors. And that makes a lot of sense if you understand that what Gamel seems to refer to over and over as arabesque is, is silhouette. Uh, I, the reason I put that quote from the Oxford English Dictionary on arabesque down there is because, uh, is because I found that the Boston School guys talked about arabesque in a very different way. They, what they talked about fit better the Oxford English Dictionary. And what Gamble talked about fits better the, the, the other model, which is the outline-based object, outline of object-based model. Which, by the way, I wonder where I have that. I have a... Uh, I have a quote from uh, Da Vinci. I'll have to find that for you, <laughs> where he actually literally describes academic painting, you know, and basically says, draw the outline and color it in. Um, and uh, it's part of his notebooks, but I found this quote that I'd drawn from his work uh, again a long time ago. So here's, shadows are flat, as flat as a hat, why they're flatter than that. Now, Gamma would say a thing like that to, to impress you with the idea of not modulating form in the shadows, not changing the values in and out in the shadows. And he would always say, 
uh, just see with how, when we talk about reflected lights, just see with how little you can do it. Well, that's a mechanical process. But what you have to learn to do is actually see the whole, which means is you have to take go back, like the Baron Grow is talking about, and take in the whole, and you'll see that, if, and, then, and then blow your eyes down. And you'll see that the major blasts of light will have very low contrast details in them. The eye on the light side, typically, not not always, but typically, and um, and uh, the uh, and the shadow side will it, it will be so quick to unless you have a big blasting backlight, it'll be so quick uh, to 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 unify with the darks of the shadow that the be that the strategy was to make the shadows as if there were no reflections there and work from that point until their turn comes, till they till they rise to the to the, to at the time appointed. So, um, yeah, here's one, always use just enough paint, isn't that great? And he, he points to you to, to uh, Ang, who says that to his students, they wanted to know how much just enough was, and that's where I've said to you before, he, so he, they walked outside the door and he saw a house painter on the, on the wall across the street, and he said, he said there, that's, that guy is using just the right amount of paint. I, I was at my, the time myself a house painter, and I know what that amount is, it's, it's the amount that you won't that you won't get in trouble with your boss for wasting, but it, but it's the, the, also the amount that covers with the greatest efficiency <laughs> so that you're not sitting there stroking it over and over and over a thousand times, wasting his money on you, the laborer. It's a fascinating thought, right? But just use just enough, right? And, and uh, just enough. And uh, so that really is to do the job and no more, right? So I see a lot of discussion. One of my students was telling me about uh, his training elsewhere in, um, and, and just literally about how they practice making the whites thick. Well, we practice using just enough, and that's, that was a product of the Paxton and Boston School of training. When painting one, one passage, look to another, so the painting takes on a general effect. So that's true, and that's, that's managing the general effect, but it's also simply the only way of, a, of, of having a truth, right? It's, the truth isn't in a particular passage. It's in the way they relate to other passages, right? So you could argue, you know, that they're true, but the whole thing typically isn't true uh, because you can't paint the sun with the yolk of an egg or you're expected to. So um, smooth out edge buildup with a palette knife, even if it means smearing shapes a bit. I've quoted that to you before, right? A bad surface is an obstacle. And uh, so that's one that you typically see with students that they'll paint and they'll have ridges all over the place. And the, if a light comes on from the side, the ridges will, will, will claw up, for example, an atmospheric area that's trying to be flat and trying to be, trying to be um, uh, value free. Those values, those are literally values, those ridges on the, on the, in the middle from brush strokes in the middle of that passage will be that. So uh, a bad surface is an obstacle. It also makes it difficult to move the paint over move it to a new place because you'll have ridges now to deal with. It'll, it'll look like an echo chamber. Don't build up highlights. Learn to paint an even surface. So there it is again. Don't build up highlights. So I, tr I try to get students involved in highlights right from the beginning, early and often. But, but then I have them scrape them down again so that we're not building up highlights, okay? And that's just basic strategy. We have that in mind. So if you need to see these highlights to see the ensemble of the general impression. Uh, and then his point is learn to paint an even surface. Those things really do go together uh, as a thought, and they probably were taking the notes taken the same day. But of course, he was pointing to me uh, things I was obviously doing that were screwy. By the way, the, uh, the red ones are ones I thought to just talk about uh, because, um, because we heard them so often, but they're also uh, ones that were clearly, struck me as purely gamalisms. Um, Okay, so the simplest way is the best way. That has to do with the amount of paint, the kind of paint you use, uh, the mediums, complex complex mediums. You never know if someone starts cracking which one did it. Those sorts of things, right? Well, here's another one on paint. Uh, don't be meager with paint. So that means if, you're paint, if you don't use enough paint, you won't have either a beautiful surface or you won't have, you might not be able to get your effect. So use the right amount of paint. Don't, uh, Gamble used to say, save on shirts to us poor kids, you know, <laughs> save on shirts. Uh, so w assuming that we would go to the store and save on, and you know, and, and buy the cheapest of something. Uh, so there's that. Look for the farthest back stragglers, the area at least like. Make it as right as possible. Now that's Gamble talking to a young student 
And that shows you how much he would actually say in one sentence that, and, that, that, and how adequate it was. I find myself sometimes running on for three and four sentences. My students are probably laughing, saying sometimes. <laughs> it's a kind of a dangerous thing in the first place. Uh, but look for the farthest stragglers. That's the, that's the sheep. That's if you've got a, sheep, a, 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 a field full of sheep, and most of them are hanging out together, but one or two of them are really going off, and they're going to be picked off by a, a coyote or something like that. You want to go after those guys, right? Bring them back into the flock. But then he says, don't fuss on one area too long or the flock will become dispersed. So um, all these things are really important because that takes away the idea of perfecting an area. And then, and there you are. It has to do with, with making it as like as you can, much more so, and then making it more like that. Bonat rule is much more fitting uh, of that sort of thinking there. Use a good deal of paint to get things down fast. Spread it professionally, generously, but carefully around the drawing. Uh, that, the way he does it, you know, uh, Mr. Donnelly's description of, um, of that lay-in, of a traced drawing, it fits that very beautifully. It doesn't always fit a, a for example, an approach taken by, by um, uh, a broken color impressionist like, like a tar bell at times. You can see plainly he was not doing that. So that's a thought, that's a thought that probably has more to do with who Gamble was and the fact that, you know, the fact of his academic thinking and his approach not thinking as a academic method, then it has to. And yet I find myself in both worlds. I find myself actually uh, wanting to do that, but I want to do it with live color. And, and then I don't have any problem at all using color into color and all that. So my idea is generous. Isn't, don't be so generous that when you put in the next color that it gets so thick you can't work with it or you have to pile in a ton just to get a little change in the previous notes. So how generous do you want to be? I want to just use what I put out there up. You know, I want to use it up without, without having my brush dry out in the process, but also one that won't create ridges. When I, when I come over and cut with the darks, for example, it won't create a big ridge. So, um, okay, shadows are loose, light's precise. Uh, it has to do with the way your eye works. That has to do with the clear obscure, too, of, of Da Vinci. But the idea is, in generalization, um, that you expect to see, because the lights are on, you expect to see greater articulation more specificity in the lights and, and, and a greater range of, for example, edges and that sort of thing. Shadows aren't like that, and they certainly at the beginning can more easily be laid in uh, more loosely. But as I've said before, we paint, we paint darks and lights. We paint masses of dark, masses of light. And, uh, and so there are times when any, either one of them uh, will, be, will be loose uh, as we go for the larger impression. Here's a fun one. Give parts enough amplitude. Don't make them too small. Uh, that was a big one. He was talking to me. Each one of these things, by the way, is coming out of a critique. So give parts enough amplitude. So I was drawing, and I would see that in other people's work, possibly more than me, but I'd be trying to get the nose on the head. And I, you know, and you'd go beyond making this stuff the way most people, most of you guys probably do, and you're trying to make parts, you know, body parts. And it's so easy. You're trying to get this part in the right place, and then you're busy drawing it up, and before you know it, and certain people, certain of my friends actually were way worse than me at this. <laughs> they would always have what looked like little faces on heads. Uh, and, um, and yeah, we were still working from the outside in. We still want to do that. We want to be working the great skull, the great forms, um, and, and gradually big building the subplots, the subforms. Uh, so that's always going to be there. So each time you go through, it's really just incorporating every part in a big re in a relationship to the whole that's, just, that's true, right? So it's still, it's still a rule of thumb. Try to Don't make your parts too small. They look mean. He used the word mean at one point in discussing this with me. Maybe it's in the next quote. Um, here's a very good one. I'll stop with this page. But I don't know how you can see the whole until you've made some of the parts. And I was talking with a, with a student just this week. At the beginning of the year, that's sort of typical. Whenever you're introducing somebody to the visual order of kind of painting, I'm trying to get people to, to actually articulate something. Don't just put a bunch of hack lines down, but, but articulate something. Articulate some parts. Well, which parts? You know, well, that's, that's the problem. Can you figure that one out? If you can sort that one out, you know there's a difference between certain parts and other parts. And you want to get to those parts, but you want to make them as like as you can so they actually will do what? Enable you to see the whole. Follow? Which is a skill in itself, right? That's a very special thing you have to learn to be able to do to grasp the whole while you're looking at parts or see the whole through the parts. 
Talent is almost nothing. I like that uh, Gamble talking here again, and we have books now called Talent is Overrated and any number of other ones. Uh, talent is almost nothing. You can't tell about talent until a person knows something. Talent is just a lubricant, you know. Well, we've found that talent is more than a lubricant. It's like a drug. It's like, a, it's like something that blocks you from getting to the next level. If you suddenly have to think, and you've been practicing just being lucky or being whatever talent provides for you, uh, I know a couple of guys myself in my own lifetime who I watched go through this thing. They had, they'd have these remarkable abilities and they'd never grow. So that's an interesting problem. Well, a guy with, who has to struggle from the beginning, and I think of like Larry Bird talking about, you know, a, um, an unathletic white man in, a, in an, an athletic black man's sport, <laughs> talking about basketball. And uh, so he had to work harder, right? And you see that a lot of times. You see that with a guy like Tom Brady who's talking about everybody else is passing him up there and being the being the uh, dominant quarterback and that stuff. So he had to work his way, work and work and work, and work his way into this, apparently. Um, and he is that kind of a guy, which gives him his success, right? He's a worker. He actually solves problems and all the rest. Gamble said, I might have become a painter if I'd learned of a type of memory drawing earlier. Well, I'm going way past the time I meant to go, so I will finish up with this page. Uh, that's, one, that's one for the books. I've never figured out precisely what he, what he meant. Um, but but uh, but the type of memory drawing he referred to was this flashing your eye, looking at something, closing your eye, and holding there, retaining that memory for a few minutes. Um, by the way, we do read about Sargent having having uh, uh, go, in, at night going to sleep or whatever, but before doing so, uh, reviewing the lines of what he'd been drawing as if from memory. So it shows you that there's a key thing. One of the key things about drawing is to learn, is to is to see what you see and learn what you see. Um, Anyway, yeah. Oh, they are. He does say it right there in the, in the red one. Pursue the avenue. One blinks. I don't need to repeat that. Okay. All right. When he's drawing a pose, especially one requiring unusual effort on the part of the model, he will have the model take the pose for one minute or two while he looks. This is Gamble talking to me direct, you know, with, with models, and I would take these notes. He'll have the model take the pose for one minute or two while he looks, then break the pose and draw. If anything will make you an artist, it's memory drawing. Do it first, last, all the time to mind the oar. That's literally what we did, and I think I've shown you those in, in another iteration, some of these drawings that I, we did with the model set up on a rainy day. We put up artificial lights and just, or we did it at night maybe, I can't remember. But Gamble had already set us up or he uh, proposed some of these ideas for us. So, okay, well, I'm going to stop at that, and another day we'll get back to some of these. So if you want, if you enjoy this part here, just look for... Um, well, I don't even know what to tell you to look for. So once you see the title of this thing, which I don't know what it's going to be, uh, I expect I'll probably use the same code word that from that point forward. So uh, and it it could be aphorisms or sayings or uh, uh, what are they called? Apothems. <laughs> um, anyway, okay. Um, that was long, and uh, some of you guys really like that. And for you, I would love to have gone off another half hour, but for my producer, he tells me, no, no, not so much, okay? In any case, uh, uh, nice to, to be back. I, that's skipping that day. There are just circumstances. Um, and I thank you for your patience with that, but actually do read through that. Uh, these, the, um, uh, if, you, if, if, if those of you didn't see it, I think it's on the same. I'll have to ask my producer, actually, how to get you there. But um, but uh, it's a written up sort of analysis of unity, and it goes very nicely with that Baron Grow quote that I just gave you. I would love to have glued into that, but I didn't have it in my hands at the moment. All right, all right. Next time, uh, do do, forget, do remember to uh, to uh, comment. Uh, questions are great. Um, I'm interested in what you're doing. I'm interested in what you're thinking, and uh, at least from my point of view, you may be interested in what I'm thinking when I, when you when you think about the same things that you're thinking about. So. Please, please, and some of you guys I know are working on this way of working, so, so please do throw that at me, or anything you're even working on, you might. So, uh, so any comments of all kinds are welcome, but especially those that are pursuing a, a, you know, an idea related to our thinking, the Boston School way of thinking. So, and, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, subscribe, get your friends to subscribe, and share, and share, and share, and share, and share. All right, again, thank you to Carol and Ms. Anonymous, and uh, really do appreciate those nice uh, donations, and we will see you in the next one.